Greetings to every, everyone with us on behalf of the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas. I would like to welcome you to the third lecture of the GP2 lectures this academic year. This series is organized by the St. John Paul II Institute of Culture, which is part of our Faculty of Philosophy here at the Angelicum in Rome. This lecture, as well as the entire GP2 lecture series, would not have taken place without the support of our university authorities, Father Thomas Joseph White, the Rector of Angelicum, and Father Serge Thomas Bonino, the Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy, whom I'd like to thank. We would also like to warmly welcome Cardinal James Michael Harvey, former prefect of the Papal Household, Archie Presbyter of Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls, and one of the cardinal electors who participated in the 2013 Papal Conclave. Special thanks are also in order for the founders of St. John Paul II Institute of Culture, donors and supporters of St. John Paul II Institute of Culture, our audience and our viewers in front of the screens. We are glad to be finally able to meet you in person. The St. John Paul II Institute of Culture was established to look at the challenges facing the modern world and the church in light of the life and thought of St. John Paul II. The idea of thinking with John Paul II was embodied in the GP2 lecture series, which are monthly lectures of eminent interdisciplinary academics who will revisit the extraordinary contribution of John Paul II of our own day. Last month, the second GP2 lectures this academic year, we had the honor of hosting Jean-Luc Marion, who undertook the phenomenological interpretation of Christian revelation in terms of openness, the saturated phenomenon, and the difficulties encountered by conceptual language in naming the sacred. In our series planned for this entire academic year, 2021-2022, we will host such renewed lectures as Professor Andrea Riccardi, Professor John Milbank, Carl Anderson, Professor Eva Thompson, Professor Stanisław Grigiel. Now, I'm pleased to give the floor to Dariusz Karłowicz, the initiator of the GP2 lecture series, the Zofer president of St. Nicholas Foundation, strategic partner of the Institute and the St. John Paul II Institute of Culture program director. Dariusz Karłowicz will share more about our today's special guest. Good afternoon, dear friends. I'm honored to introduce to you to George Weigel, American Catholic philosopher and theologian, author of over 20 books, among them the famous biography of St. John Paul II in two volumes, Witness to Hope and the End, uh, and the End and the Beginning. His distinguished senior fellow and chair of Catholic studies at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, D.C. George Weigel has received 19 honorary doctorate degrees, as well as the Papal Cross Pro Ecclesia et Pontificia, and the Gloria Artis Gold Medal from the Polish Ministry of Culture, what I mentioned with pleasure as a poll. Uh, what about the topic of uh, lecture? In this lecture, Professor Weigel, refers to Karol Wojtyla's reflection on the Athenian meeting of St. Paul with the philosophers described uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. In this context, Professor Weigel will analyze inter alia, the fundamental for St. John Paul II's understanding of the West as the fruit of meeting of Athens and Jerusalem, 
he will discuss Christocentrism and the Christian humanism characteristic of the papal teaching and will draw attention to the importance of Voitila belief in the theotropic nature of the human person. In his reflection, Professor Weigel will show the importance of these topics for the current crisis in the Western world. Professor Weigel, the floor is yours. Dziękuję bardzo, Darius, for that kind introduction. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I want to begin by thanking the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas and Theologia Politichna for their organizing of this St. John Paul II Institute of Culture here at the Angelicum. I'm sure it will make a significant contribution to Catholic reflection throughout the world. Uh, I have been treated most kindly here at the Angelicum uh, for the past two weeks, and for that I wish to thank the rector, my old friend Father Thomas Joseph White, uh, Sister Maria Silva, who makes everything work uh, beautifully, Father Cesare Inchevich for his hospitality, and uh, Marta here, Bronievska, for all that she did to organize this. I, I too, want to recognize several uh, special guests and old friends, His Eminence Cardinal James Harvey, uh, an old and dear friend, and Ambassador Count Antonio Zanardi Landi, the ambassador of the Order of Malta to the Holy See, and a distinguished Italian diplomat. Uh, I will also note the presence of Father Kevin Flannery here, uh, an ecumenical gesture. Uh, as Father Flannery is on the faculty of a younger university nearby uh, here, uh, but we're happy to have him uh, as well as the distinguished members of the Angelicum family. On May 18, 1920, a third child and second son was born to a retired Polish army officer Captain Karol Wojtyła and his wife Emilia in Wadowice, a provincial town some 50 kilometers west of Krakow. The child was named for his father at his baptism on June 20th, and to what would have been the stunned surprise of everyone present that day, that child grew up to be the emblematic figure of the second half of the 20th century. As no less a figure than Henry Kissinger put it a few minutes after the death of John Paul II on April 2nd, 2005. But perhaps not the stunned surprise of everyone. For when the little boy's mother pushed him in a pram through the streets of Vadovica, she would sometimes say to her neighbors, my Lolek will be a great man someday. Or so the pious legend has it. You're a very tough audience. You can laugh at these little moments here. I'm not used to the Roman university style. I uh, like to have a little humor in these things. The nature of John Paul II's greatness can be measured in several ways. Dr. Kissinger was likely referring to the Polish Pope's pivotal role in the collapse of European communism. That was no mean accomplishment, for it demonstrated the power of aroused consciences and the experience of solidarity among diverse peoples to bend the curve of history in a more humane direction. Yet John Paul II's enduring greatness may well have to do more with his penetrating analysis of the human condition in late modernity and post-modernity. The insights central to that analysis 
grew out of his rock-solid faith, which gave him a remarkable capacity to see the world through a biblical lens, his intense and broad-ranging intellectual life through which he understood what he had seen, and his extensive pastoral experience which helped him grasp the effect of what he had seen and heard in people's lives. And the salience of his analysis has increased, not decreased, over time. In this third decade of the 21st century, John Paul II's reading of the signs of the times remains a serviceable template for understanding our civilization's discontents and devising ways to rebuild the West's destabilized moral cultural foundations. Some of the seeds from which John Paul II's analysis of the late modern and postmodern West grew can be discerned in Teachings for an Unbelieving World, a series of reflections or catecheses now available in book form, in which then Archbishop Carol Wojtyla, writing in the mid-1960s, pondered St. Paul's encounter with the great and the good of first century Athens uh, on the Areopagus as described in Acts 17, which we should pause a moment and revisit. St. Luke writes, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who chanced to be there. Some also of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers met him, and some said, what would this babbler say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. And they took hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you present? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Sounds like Twitter 2,000 years ago. So St. Paul, standing in the middle of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens... I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all men life and breath and everything. And he made from every nation of men to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their habitation, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel after him and find him, yet he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, a representation by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked but now he commands all men everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all men by raising him from the dead. 
Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from among them, but some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. That encounter held a special place in Carol Wojtyla's religious imagination. For it seemed to him a biblical metaphor for the church's situation in post-Christian Europe and indeed throughout the postmodern world. The apostle of the Gentiles tried to introduce the Athenians to the unknown God, the one true God, through an appeal to the Athenians' own experience. Boitiwa's pastoral work in creating zones of freedom in communist-dominated Poland convinced him that the church of the late 20th century and the third millennium also had to meet men and women where the church found them in all their confusions and strivings. Like St. Paul on the Areopagus, the church had to work from the material at hand, the semina verbi, if you will, in trying to open chilly hearts and brittle minds to the warmth and liberating truth of the gospel. That Athenian metaphor was challenging, of course, because St. Paul's efforts on the Areopagus met with resistance and no and little immediate success. But that, too, may help explain the attraction of this vignette from Acts for Wojtyla. His uncanny ability to read the signs of the times likely included the intuition that great effort would be necessary over many years to reconvert a post-Christian West to the truths of biblical religion. As in first century Athens, so today, the enculturation of the gospel in smugly self-satisfied societies and cultures is never easy. Carol Wojtyla's Athenian meditations preview several crucial themes he would develop in his papal magisterium and strengthen the claim that John Paul II's greatness lay not only in his influence on the public life of his own era, but in his ability to dig beneath the surface of history, to discern the deeper currents that would shape the future for good or for ill. Eight of these themes in Wojtyla's reflections on Acts 17 merits special attention. The first theme then is what is the West? At the outset of his Athenian catechesis, Karol Wojtyla asserts that the deepest root of the civilizational project we call the West, those deepest roots are found in Jerusalem and Athens and ultimately in their interaction. Paul, the scholar Pharisee who was obviously familiar with trends in Greek philosophy, was the first to try to build a conceptual bridge between the two. After some centuries of hard intellectual work, that bridge was built. And across it walked those who gave Christianity the Nicene Creed and the dogmatic definitions of ecumenical councils, such as Ephesus, Chalcedon, and the Third Council of Constantinople. The meeting of Jerusalem and Athens in a powerful intellectual synthesis was not only crucial for Christianity, however, it was central to shaping Western civilization. Jerusalem taught the West that history is neither cyclical nor random, but linear and purposeful. History is going somewhere, so is humanity, 
and the foundational image for that sense of purposefulness and direction in Western civilization is Israel's exodus from Egyptian bondage. Athens, for its part, taught the West that there are truths built into the world and into us, that we can know those truths with a measure of certainty through the arts of reason, and that knowing those truths, we come to understand our moral obligations and what makes for human flourishing and social solidarity. Wojtyla was acutely aware that the interaction of Jerusalem and Athens was essential to the development of Christianity's intellectual architecture, for Athens had given the church born in and from Jerusalem the conceptual tools to turn Christianity's basic charismatic proclamation, Jesus is Lord, into creed and doctrine. And over the centuries, Athens, the arts of reason, had often helped purify Christianity from heresy and superstition. <clears throat> By the same token, Jerusalem challenged and continues to challenge Athens to raise its sights to stretch its imagination, and to be alert for signals of transcendence in the world that philosophy analyzes through reason. That mutually enriching, civilizational shaping interaction found one of its taproots in Paul's experience on the Areopagus. Little wonder then that a philosopher bishop with a deep appreciation of Judaism, would find in that apostolic experience in Athens a rich load of material for reflection on the Western civilizational project and its contemporary challenges. Then there is the second theme. Humanity is theotropic. Theotropic. In his Athenian meditations and throughout his pontificate, Carol Wojtyla lifted up a truth essential to understanding the current discontents of a, war, of a West chained in the self-constructed dungeon of secularism. And that truth is that the human spirit has an innate yearning for the divine and a hardwired instinct for worship. And because of that, if true objects of belief and worship are not found, false objects of belief and worship will be found. As Wojtyla noted in reflecting on St. Paul's encounter with muddled Athenian religiosity, human beings thirst for answers to the great questions of life, including the question of why there is anything at all, the question of what purpose life has, and the question of what destiny awaits each of us. Those are philosophical questions. And in his 1998 encyclical, Fides et Ratio, John Paul II challenged philosophy to recover its nerve, to stop frittering away its energies on thinking about thinking about thinking, and to take up the big questions again. For Wojtyla, of course, the big questions were also profoundly religious questions. The search for answers to them can lead to false gods or to the true God, but it will lead somewhere. In the agony of the 20th century that he knew from his experiences under Nazism and communism, John Paul II saw the lethal results of worshiping false gods. Surveying the European cultural scene in the years immediately following the Second Vatican Council, 
he sensed how contempt for biblical religion had led to a soured nihilism and a diminishment of the human spirit. And like St. Paul, he wanted to turn humanity's innate religious instinct toward the true God who is alone worthy of worship, the God who enlarges rather than diminishes worshiping humanity. In order to do that, though, Christianity had to clarify just who this God is. Which brings us to the third theme in Wojtyla's Areopagus Catechesis, which is the theme, God is not a rival. John Paul II's interest in phenomenology as a philosophical method is well known. Yet for all that he was influenced by phenomenology's determination to get philosophy out of the quicksand pit of subjectivism and reconnected to what the phenomenologist called the things themselves, Harold Wojtyla's philosophical work was grounded in the realism of Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, which expressed what Athens had taught the West. There is something properly called the truth, and we can know it. The Thomistic dimension of this philosophical foundation is apparent when in the third of the Athenian meditations, Wojtyla reminds his readers that the God of the Bible is not some super being in competition with the beings of this world, the mistake constantly made by the atheistic humanists of the 19th century and replicated by the so-called new, new atheists of today. Rather, God is sheer being itself. The God who identified himself to Moses and Israel as I am who am and I am in Exodus 3.13 is the philosopher's ipsum esse subsistens in Summa Theologiae 1.4, that which makes all other being possible. And because this God is not in competition with other beings, we can know God as what Wojtyla calls in the Athenian meditations the inner mystery of every creature, and especially of the human person. God as the one in whom, as St. Paul put it to the Athenian Stoics and Epicureans, we live and move and have our being. Here, Karol Wojtyla believed, was an important antidote, answer to modernity's tendency to diminish or dumb down the human person despite all of modernity's Promethean pretensions. The tendency is to diminish or dumb down the human person. On the Areopagus, Paul sudden, subtly, subtly, with subtlety, challenged the Athenians to think of themselves as grander than they had previously imagined by encountering the unknown God who makes himself known in history and indeed enters history in order to lead humanity to its true destiny. This Pauline conviction would be at the center of John Paul II's papal magisterium for over a quarter century as in numerous variations on one majestic theme he would tell the late modern and postmodern world, you are greater than you've been taught to think you are. You are more than a bundle of twitching desires. Permit me and the entire biblical tradition to remind you that the grandeur of the human person lies in that creativity which is struck from the fire of the creator himself. 
On the Areopagus of the postmodern world, then, Christianity must lift up the sights and aspirations of a humanity accustomed to looking down. And that, Carol Wojtyla understood, requires a fresh consideration of the meaning of freedom, which brings us to the fourth theme. Choice is not everything. Choice is not everything. Athenians, or at least that minority of Athenians who were free men, prided themselves on their freedom to choose, to be self-governing. That pride has been grotesquely distorted in those influential sectors of the contemporary West where assertiveness is taken as the index of maturity and choice has become the word that stops all political argument. In his Athenian meditations, Wojtyla briefly sketched a theme that would become prominent in the second half of his pontificate. Our choosing must be related to what reason can grasp as the true and the good if our choosing is to be truly human. Sheer willfulness is childish. A mature freedom is one that seeks the truth freely, adheres to it freely because it leads to the good, and does so out of moral habit. Freedom and responsibility Poitewa insists, are intimately linked, and a truly responsible, mature exercise of the will is tethered to truth and ordered to goodness. And as he would teach in the 1991 encyclical Centesimus Annus, this richer idea of freedom is not just critical for individuals, our moral lives, and our relationships, it is just as important for the free society. A democracy in which choice, understood as willfulness, triumphs over every other claim, cannot indefinitely survive, for it will inevitably become a democracy at war with itself and its commitments to the first principles of justice, including the first principle of justice which teaches us that innocent human life deserves the protection of the law. Which is why in the 1995 encyclical Evangelium Vitae, John Paul II taught that the life issues of abortion and euthanasia are in fact social justice issues. Then there is the fifth theme. Jesus Christ is the answer to the question that is every human life. In his Mars Hill catechesis, and particularly in his Athenian meditations on the meaning of the incarnation, the resurrection, and redemption, Wojtyla displayed the radical Christocentricity that had characterized the Second Vatican Council and that would characterize his papal magisterium. It was, of course, Paul's proclamation of the resurrection of Jesus that quickly became a sign of contradiction to many of his Athenian listeners, some of whom could imagine the immortality of the soul, but none of whom could grasp what a resurrected body could possibly be or what the resurrection of the dead might mean. Yet, St. Paul insisted and John Paul II underscored throughout his papacy that the resurrection is the sine qua non of the entire Christian experience and the entire Christian proposal. No resurrection, no encounter with the risen one, no Christianity, period. Conversely, meeting the risen Lord personally as St. Paul did on the road to Athens, 
or meeting him in the act of faith and in word and sacrament, as Christians have done for two millennia, changes everything. Changes everything. Especially how we think about human destiny, which is not just the avoidance of oblivion in some disembodied state of consciousness, but the glorification of the human condition in a state of being that is radically different, but manifestly human. The Second Vatican Council's most concise expression of this Easter faith comes in paragraph 22 of Gaudium et Spes, the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. There, the council fathers wrote a profound testament to Christian humanism in words that may well have been crafted by the Archbishop of Krakow, Karol Wojtyla, when they wrote, it is only in the mystery of the word made flesh that the mystery of man truly becomes clear. Christ the Lord, Christ the new Adam, and the very revelation of the mystery of the Father and of his love fully reveals man to himself and brings to light his most high calling. As Christ, the incarnate Son of God and risen Lord, reveals the face of the merciful Father, he simultaneously reveals the full truth about us to us. St. Paul tried to get the Athenians to understand that two millennia ago. Convinced, as he once put, put it to Henri de Lubac, that a pulverization of the human person was at the root of late modernity's crisis of crises, John Paul II, in Pauline fashion, proposed a revitalized Christocentric humanism in his work at the Second Vatican Council and throughout his pontificate, beginning with the inaugural homily on October 22nd, 1978, and in his inaugural encyclical Redemptor Hominis. Then there is the sixth theme. Salvation is at bottom a matter of love. Like St. Paul on the Areopagus, Wojtyla's Athenian catechesis teach that the unknown God who revealed himself to Israel and is definitely, definitively encountered in Jesus the Lord wishes to save that which he has created, which means redeeming the world from its incompleteness and folly. Now, redemption requires judgment for there is much that must be set aright, and as Isaiah reminds us throughout Advent, justice must be sought and oppression corrected. Yet in the God whom St. Paul proclaimed, Wojtyla noted, justice is reconciled with love, the supreme witness of which, as he put it, was the unbreakable bond between the cross and the resurrection. Raising his suffering, obedient servant Jesus from the dead to a new and supercharged realm of life, the God whom Paul wanted to introduce to Athens demonstrated that divine love is the most powerful thing imaginable, for it is more powerful than death itself. The God whom St. Paul proclaimed is thus more than an unmoved mover a first cause, even more than a creator. The God of St. Paul is the redeemer, the one who has overcome everything, as Wojtyla put it in his meditations, because this God is love itself. That was the conviction on which Karol Wojtyla staked the great adventure that was his life. The dissident Yugoslavian Marxist Milovan Gilas once said 
that John Paul II was the only person he had ever met who was entirely without fear. The root of that fearlessness was John Paul's unshakable belief in the cruciform, redemptive power of divine love. At the same time, Voite was defining conviction that the God who is love had entered history as redeemer, as well as making history possible as creator. That defining uh, conviction was the source of his remarkable capacity to enter empathetically into everyone's lives, into others' lives. Everyone Wojtyla met was a someone for whom divine love had entered the world as redeeming and salvific in the person of the incarnate Son of God. Which brings us to the seventh theme. Love is self gift. In the Magisterium of John Paul II, citations of Gaudium et Spes 22 are frequently paired with citations of Gaudium et Spes 24, another text in which Wojtyla likely had an authorial hand. And I quote, man can only fully discover his true self in a sincere giving of himself. Jesus Christ reveals the truth about us, the Council Fathers taught in Gaudium et Spes 22, and in Gaudium et Spes 24, an essential part of that truth, demonstrated by Christ's passion, death, and resurrection, is that self-gift, not self-assertion, is the royal road to human flourishing and ultimately to beatitude. This is obviously a countercultural claim in the 21st century West, where self assertion underwrites a host of social movements, some of which, such as gender ideology, proclaim an infinitely plastic and malleable humanity. As a Christian theologian and pastor, Carol Wojtyla knew and taught that self gift modeled in Christ is at the center of an Easter-based Christian ethics. And as a philosopher, Wojtyla argued that there is a law of the gift, as he put it, a law of self-giving built into the human person, and that law of the gift could be discovered through a disciplined reflection on the structure of human moral agency. As he put it in a 1974 conference paper given at Fossa Nuovo to mark one of the great anniversaries of the death of St. Thomas Aquinas, in the experience of self-determination, the human person stands revealed before us as a distinctive structure of self-possession and self-governance, and it is precisely when one becomes a gift for others that one most fully becomes oneself. Thus, once again, faith and reason, Jerusalem and Athens, can work together in a Pauline synthesis to lift the human spirit from the loneliness imposed by self-absorption and willfulness, raising human aspirations beyond the quest for immediate gratification and satisfaction. And thus we come to the eighth theme, from Vatican II to the new evangelization. Carol Wojtyla's Athenian meditations quote extensively from the documents of the Second Vatican Council, which like the Second World War, was a decisive experience for him. Vatican II was many things to Wojtyla. It was a second graduate level education in theology, an encounter with thinkers and ideas he had not previously met. It was a bracing first experience of the new Christians of the third world. The spontaneity and clarity of the faith of the African bishops he met at the council, 
left a deep impression on Voitewa, and senior African churchmen, often first or second generation Christians, would play prominent roles in his pontificate. Perhaps above all, Voitewa lived Vatican II as what John XXIII intended it to be, a new experience of Pentecost, from which the church would enter its third millennium with revitalized evangelical zeal and a new passion for mission. As Pope, Wojtyla put evangelism at the very center of his teaching, using the image of the Areopagus in the 1991 encyclical Redemptoris Missio to illustrate the sectors of late modern and postmodern society where the laity were particularly fit to be the agents of evangelization. The worlds of science and the media, the environmental and women's movements, the worlds of politics, culture, and economics. All of these Mars Hills awaited disciples willing to propose the true God as the answer to the 21st century's confusions about unknown gods or false gods. And it was John Paul II's purpose to call everyone in the church to be a missionary disciple. So in Novo Millennio in Aunte, entering the third millennium, his apostolic letter closing the great jubilee of 2000, John Paul adopted an image from the fifth chapter of Luke's gospel and summoned the church to put out into the deep, Duke in Altum, Luke 5, verse 5, put out into the deep of the late modern and postmodern worlds to leave the shallow, sometimes brackish waters of institutional maintenance and set out on the roiling, turbulent waters of the 21st century in order to make a great catch, not of fish, but of souls. A final thought. As John Paul II understood it, the new evangelization also included the church's public witness. As he envisioned it, the church of the 20th, 21st century would be neither an established church nor a partisan church, neither a church that sought to put state power behind its truth claims, nor a church allied to a political party. As he wrote in Redem Torres Missio, the church proposes she imposes nothing. The church asks, and if necessary, the church demands, as it did under communism, to be able to make its evangelical proposal in public. And the church claims the right as a civil society institution to be a vigorous partner in the public debate. But the church does not seek legal establishment, nor does it act as chaplain to any political party. Partisanship jeopardizes the independence of the church, and even more importantly, partisanship reduces the gospel to a political program, precisely one of the criticisms that John Paul II made of certain forms of Latin American liberation theology. Nor was the 21st century church anticipated in Wojtyla's Athenian meditations and described in John Paul II's Magisterium, a privatized church, withdrawn from the public square by its own decision, by the application of coercive state power, or both. European and Latin American Catholicism had long been used to ecclesiastical establishment. Those days, John Paul II knew, were over. And the alternative to ecclesiastical establishment was neither a privatized church, nor a ghettoized church, nor a partisan church, but a public church. What John Paul II called in Redemptoris Missio a proposing church. 
This proposing church would work in public primarily through the free associations of civil society. The proposing public Catholicism of the 21st century would make arguments. It would not seek to craft policies, although the arguments it made would underscore that some policies were more compatible than others with freedom lived in solidarity and for the common good. The proposing public church sketched by John Paul II's social magisterium would work at a deeper level of public life, a level of cultural self-understanding. The church would, in other words, be the guardian and teacher of the truths that make it possible to live freedom well. In addition to telling us something about the church, however, this idea of a public church also tells us something about the free society in the 21st century. The openness of the free society, the open society, must be comprehensive. The free and open society cannot mean a public space from which religious conviction is excluded as a source of moral and political insight. Thus, John Paul II believed it was past time for the West to rid itself of the cultural hangover caused by the idea that democracy, freedom, tolerance, and openness require a laicite that creates a religiously naked public square. That claim is itself undemocratic for it denies to many citizens the right to bring the deepest sources of their moral convictions into public life. The post-Christian West is increasingly the post-rational West, as demonstrated by dysfunctional politics across the North Atlantic world and by the Western inability to mount a strong, culturally transmitted and politically resonant defense of democracy and the free society on anything other than utilitarian grounds. John Paul II saw this coming. The public church he envisioned, neither established nor partisan nor ghettoized, would play an important role in revitalizing the convictions about reason and truth that were cornerstones in the cultural architecture of the West. In order to do this, of course, the church must purify itself so that the truths it proposes are, soon, are seen to be the truths it lives. Harold Wojtyla's meditations on St. Paul's experience on the Areopagus and the preview they give us of his papal magisterium thus unveil aspects of John Paul II's greatness that can be lost if our gaze is focused too narrowly on the likelihood that he was the most publicly consequential pope, the pope with the greatest impact on the history of his times since the high Middle Ages. As the world reflected on his achievement at his centenary last year, Millions of men and women now living in free societies gave thanks that John Paul II inspired and shaped a revolution of conscience in the 1980s that shaped the distinctive revolution of 1989 and the largely nonviolent collapse of European communism. It is important to remember, however, that the greatness of the man whom many call St. John Paul the Great was not limited to his impact on the world of affairs, nor was it simply a manifestation of striking personal gifts and qualities. For he was, above all, a radically converted Christian disciple and a Christian pastor who, in his dedication to that pastoral work, believed that his discipleship and his pastoral responsibilities demanded 
a careful analysis of the signs of the times. His analysis of those signs remains as salient and relevant today as it was when Karol Wojtyla wrote his Athenian Meditations over a half century ago, or when John Paul II looked into the post-Cold War future and identified the many challenges facing Western democracies whose moral and cultural foundations were eroding with inevitable effects on public life and politics. Neither the world nor the Catholic Church has adequately learned from that analysis. Both would do well to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much for that impressive lecture, which helped us to take a look on nowadays Christian problem through the experience of Areopagus meeting, first spectacular meeting of philosophy and Christianity. Uh, now we have a discussion, so if you have any question, please uh, uh, come here and and ask a question. Then we can. So, if there's okay, so that's also that's all. Okay, okay, that's also that's also possible. and myself first. My name is uh, Melson. I am a Russell Berry Fellow here and I study in interreligious studies. Uh, it was a great lecture, Professor Weigel. I heard it carefully. Uh, you rightly stated that uh, Pope John Paul II was focused in a specific field of philosophy, in ethics, and you quoted Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas. Aristotle for sure is um, wrote it in the concept of eudaimonia and the pursuit of the goodness and pursuit of the truth and disconnected with uh, the philosophy of uh, Pope John Paul II. But I am particularly interested on another concept of Pope John Paul II, the concept of suffering, or in uh, in Greek, pasku, if I'm not wrong. Uh, what place uh, feels the concept of suffering in uh, a philosophical thought of John Paul II and in his uh, actions as an acting person during his papacy? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Are we on here? Yeah. Um, As the students whom I've been uh, privileged to work with here for the last couple of weeks uh, will know already, uh, this theme of suffering uh, and its importance in the thought of John Paul II, I think emerges um, in a particularly profound way during the Second World War. Um, during that period, which I believe was the formative experience of his life, um, he was introduced by a striking character named Jan Tiranovsky, a layman with maybe a high school education, who was a self-taught specialist in the classic spirituality of the Carmelite reform of the 16th century specifically John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila. And Jan Tiranovsky, who was leading in Wojtyla's parish what we would call today youth ministry, and was a kind of lay spiritual director to 
Wojtyla, must have sensed that this literarily inclined young man who had been writing poems since he was in grammar school uh, would be engaged by the mystical poetry of, of John of the Cross and the work of Teresa of Avila. So what, what did Wojtyla learn from all of that? Well, at the center of Carbolite spirituality, as I understand it, is the cross. That the cross is the axis mundi. The cross is where creation and redemption meet. Uh, it, the cross is what identifies. It's the trail marker to uh, beatitude uh, and the kingdom of God. And that there is no getting to Easter without going through Good Friday. Okay, there's no passage to Easter that does not pass through. There's no passage to the empty tomb and to the appearances that does, that does not pass through Calvary. I described this experience and what it meant for him to my students here at the Angelicum in, the, in these terms. I, I, most people, certainly in the United States, I suspect, in most of the Western world, have no idea how awful the Second World War was in Poland. Uh, One-fifth of the population of Poland that was alive in 1939 was dead in 1945. As one of Wojtyla's seminary classmates put it to me 30 years ago, it was not a question of knowing whether you would be alive on your next birthday or Christmas or Easter. For five years, you lived in a situation where you didn't know whether you would be alive tomorrow morning because occupied, that occupied part of Poland, known as the, the general government, presided over from Krakow's Wawel Castle by a thug named Hans Frank, uh, was a completely lawless area. I didn't, Gestapo guy or Wehrmacht so didn't like the way you looked at him, he shoots you and that's the end of the story. Yeah. That is a pressurized situation. Uh, and people reacted to it in different ways. Some people went into violent resistance. Some people went mad. Some people hid. Wojtyla processing that, if you will, through this Carmelite spirituality of non-absurd suffering. came to a different end. As I said to the students, the pressures of that period can be compared to the pressures underneath the crust of the earth. We all know that underneath the surface of the earth, there's all sorts of stuff going on. It's hot, it's violent, it's uh, tremendous energies. And they can break out in very destructive ways. Earthquakes, Vesuvius, tsunamis, whatever. But something else forms because of those pressures. Diamonds. Hardest, brightest thing we know. And those pressures of the Second World War refined, if you will, or transformed by this Carmelite spirituality, this Carmelite cruciform spirituality, I have often said to audiences, turned young Carol Wojtyla into a kind of human diamond who could cut through things that seemed impermeable, the Berlin Wall, for example, who reflected light in an extraordinary way. One of my favorite stories in Witness to Hope is of the Pope meeting Elena Bonner, the wife of Andrei Sakharov, a very tough woman, uh, completely religiously unobservant, uh, no stake in the God of the Bible, whatever. Uh, and she comes out of an hour and a half private meeting with John Paul II in tears and says to her friend who told me the story, that Mrs. Bonner said, he's the most extraordinary man I've ever met. 
He is all light. He is a source of light. When you put the war experience with the Carmelite spirituality together, I think that, that's what you get. I normally don't speak at these occasions, so this is special for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I am duly honored. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to take you up from what you concluded, that the church and the world somehow is not taking too much, uh, not taking seriously the analysis of Pope John Paul II. And in that text, I'm wondering, 16 years down the road after his death, whether the Christian West, the Christian in uh, italics or whatever, the Christian West, whether we are slowly building up another altar to an unknown God, whether our society losing, I'm thinking of what happened in Europe recently when we said, oh, it's not going to be happy Christmas anymore, we'll be like the Americans, just happy holidays and so on. So is that slowly, as I say, 20 years down the road now, will there be another altar to an unknown God? Thank you. Thank you, Father. Um, I, I hope this isn't telling tales out of school, but about 10 or 12 years ago, I was visiting my uh, good friend, Cardinal Francis Arinze, when he was still the prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments. It was December, and the little lit sign on the door of the Congregation for Divine Worship said, Buone Feste. I went into him, I said, what's going on here? What happened to Buon Natale here? Get, get that out of here. This is bad American export here. So it's not just the EU, although it's bad enough. Um, I think the most dangerous of the false gods that is having altars erected to it all over the Western world today, certainly in the United States, uh, is the false god of gender ideology, uh, which is the most powerful expression of the new Gnosticism that is having a terrible effect all over the Western world. And by the new Gnosticism, I mean something I hinted at in the lecture, that there is nothing given in the human condition. There are no things as they are. Everything is subject to alteration by acts of human will made possible by technology. I had the pleasure of being back in Krakow this summer for the first time in a couple of years. I had taught there every year for 28 years and then we were interrupted by the plague in 2020. I always feel like Camus when I say that. Um, I was back last year and had dinner one night with several old friends, one of whom was Polish nobleman, distinguished art historian, mid-80s, I should think. He hadn't heard too much about this transgender business. And somehow the dinner conversation turned to that and he listened carefully. And after about five minutes of this, he looked up and he said, what happened to chromosomes? Pretty good question, actually. And I said, well, chromosomes have been trumped. That's not a political statement. Chromosomes have been overrun by the new Gnosticism, that not even chromosomes count. I mean, the most fundamental building blocks of personal identity personal reality, if you will, have, um, have been 
simply brushed aside by the power of this new Gnosticism. And its power, I think, is uh, evident uh, in the fact that um, as my dear friend, Dr. Paul McHugh, most distinguished psychiatrist in the United States, the man who basically killed Sigmund Freud in the United States and, and thought he had killed transgender gender reassignment surgeries at Johns Hopkins, where he was chief of psychiatry for 25 years and has now had to see that part of his work uh, unraveled. Um, as Dr. McHugh has argued and been vilified for arguing, there is no scientific evidence of positive long-term mental health outcomes from so-called gender reassignment surgery. None. Zero. And yet, the ideology is so strong, and the fear of being called transphobic or whatever is so pervasive that people at medical training center, which imagines itself the medical center of not the earth, but the galaxy, Johns Hopkins, are back doing this stuff again. That's how powerful this is. Now, um, as I said in a recent letter, uh, le lecture in Washington, there are some in the church who think the way we need to respond to this is by, if I may say in Dominican circles, Savonarola 2.0. That's tempting, I have to say. You know, when I listened to the oral argument before the Supreme Court on December 1st and one of the justices reveals herself to be unfamiliar with high school biology, yeah, I mean, Savonarola 2.0 becomes uh, somewhat attractive, despite what happened to him. Um, but that's not what we need. We need to lift up the nobler vision of what happens to human beings when they worship truly, when the object of their worship is the one who is truly worthy of worship. And if we can do that, I think eventually just the utter implausibility of all of this other stuff, which is not contributing to the sum total of human happiness. Do the people who are promoting gender ideology, abortion on demand, euthanasia, sex reassignment surgery, do these sound like happy people? No, they're angry people. They're fearful people. We can offer them something better than their fears, I think. That's what Gaudium et Spes 22 taught. Thank you. Um, I had two very quick questions uh, for you. Uh, it seems to me uh, from your lecture that you give great importance to the ideas of John Paul II, which are in a way uh, immortal. However, it also seems to me that a great part of John Paul II's message was himself as a person, as a sort of witness to these ideas. Uh, and obviously, as any person, he is not immortal. Obviously, he is now dead. His memory might be immortal. But it seems to me that the great weight of his ideas was in some ways connected to his person and to his ability to connect with people. Uh, so I wonder, you know, in uh, a renaissance of these ideas that you might envisage, what importance is played by people uh, like John Paul II, who can be witnesses uh, to these ideas. And the second question, uh, you know, as, as Father Glenn was mentioning, John Paul II has been dead only 16 years, which, you know, from a historical perspective, 
perspective is a pretty short time. You know, I would say, you know, Jesus Christ, 15 years after his death, was probably not <laughs> super highly rated amongst the whole population of the world. So, you know, if, if you were to think of yourself in a total hypothetical in 100, 200, 300 years ago, where do you see these ideas? Uh, are you optimistic or pessimistic? Well, as uh, let's begin with the with the second, and then move back to the first. Thank you, Alessandro. Um, as my dear friend, the late great Father Paul Mankowski uh, used to say, uh, "I see no reasons for optimism, and I have every reason to hope," because that's what a Christian says under any circumstances. Um, let me go back to where I ended a moment ago, just at the purely mundane, ultra-mundane level. Uh, the misery that is the unhappiness that is being uh, added up by the new Gnosticism has got to provoke some sort of a reckoning at some point. So in a purely mundane calculus, um, stupid ideas usually reveal themselves to be that in history over time. Now, in the 20th century, that left 60 million people dead. So we, we hope the revelation of the stupidity comes a bit more quickly. Where will that come from? It comes from us. Uh, I think there's a sense in which, yes, it's true, uh, he was a person message. Um, particularly, I think, at the end, to go back to the first question in his witness to suffering, uh, the number of people who have come up to me in the past 16 years and said, I don't know anything about this stuff, but I was in a wheelchair then, or I was in the hospital then, or I had a serious disease then, and I felt accompanied, which is not a new idea in the church. Carol Wojtyla described his pastoral method with university students in 1948 as accompaniment. That made a huge difference. On the other hand, I think we have to say, looking back in an examination of conscience, which is always good for the church and for the people, particularly the people who lead the church, whether that leadership is ecclesiastical or intellectual or whatever. Uh, we leaned on him too much, and now it's up to us. I mean, if we believe that he bore the truth of the Christian message and its possibilities to cut through the impermeable and shed light in dark places, uh, then we owe it to his memory to pick that banner up and, and, and carry it forward. Now, I think if you look at this now thoroughly global church, I mean, we are now Catholic small c in a way we've never been in 2,000 years. Uh, this is no longer a European phenomenon with a few outlying bits and pieces around the world. This is a genuinely global reality, the Catholic Church. The living parts of that Catholic Church are the parts that have understood and are trying to embody pastorally John Paul II's authoritative interpretation of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, and the dying parts of the world church are those that are still trying to make the failed project that I have called for 20 years Catholic light work. Sorry for the Coca-Cola imagery here. And I discovered the hard way in a recent book that went into six different translations that it gets even worse when I write 
Catholic light leads to Catholic zero. Like Coke light led to Coke zero. This just does not work in other linguistic environments. So I've now started to use the term adoption, frankly, from a Polish sociologist, Zygmunt Bellman, who used to talk about liquid modernity. Um, not a great fan of his intellectual work, but that's a great phrase. And I'm now trying to use the phrase liquid Catholicism. Catholicism without any sense of rootedness in scripture and tradition. Catholicism without a sense of doctrinal and moral boundaries. Who's interested in that? Nobody as, for example, mass attendance figures in a certain country to the north of here uh, will amply demonstrate. It's just uninteresting. It reduces the church to a non-governmental organization. In that particular case, a very wealthy non-governmental organization. But if you look at the living parts of the world church, whether they're in tough circumstances in Western Europe or in Central and Eastern Europe or in North America, Latin America, Asia, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa. The keys to the council provided by John Paul II and Benedict XVI have been grasped and are being used to advance the project of, of the new evangelization. And the new evangelization is important not just to grow the church. It's important to save the culture. There is not going to be a reform or a rebuilding of these cultural foundations of the Western world without a recovery of biblical religion or at least respect for biblical religion. It's not going to happen. Because when you lose the guide of the Bible, when you lose Jerusalem, it turns out you lose Athens as well. Because when you lose the idea that the creator imprinted, if you will, the divine rationality into the world, and you lose the idea of the logos, then suddenly that Athenian accomplishment, there are truths built into the world and into us, and we can grasp them and know what we should know, that gets weak. So there's your truth and my truth, but nothing called the truth. So the two really do go together. Um, uh, thank you. First, first of all, thank you for your for your lecture. Uh, this is more a personal question, but I did not want to lose the opportunity of asking you this. Uh, you have a very brilliant academic career, and I wanted to ask you that what would your advice be for a young Catholic man uh, committed to the truth that is thinking about dedicating his professional life to an academic life? Thank you. Well, it's very kind of you to say that. I have no academic career. <laughs> I mean, I escaped the academy in 1977. 44 years ago, when the seminary I was teaching in closed, and I have been in the world of research institutes and writing since then. And, and with all due respects to the academics present, uh, that, was a, that was a great thing for me. Uh, it, it liberated me to do all sorts of things I otherwise would not have done. Uh, I would suggest to anyone who does seek an academic career uh, as a vocation, and there are lots of smart people in this room you could talk to about that. Dr. Russell Hittinger is here. I think that's Father Flannery. I've already identified as our ecumenical show and tell here for the day. Father Geertick here? Did I see him here? No, I guess not. Anyway, lots of smart people here. Father Thomas Joseph was here a minute ago. He's escaped. Um, you'd get much better advice from them. Let me just raise this thought. Uh, certainly in the American context, and this may have European analogs that I simply don't understand, uh, I think anyone entering academic life today should look for niche 
schools, small Catholic liberal arts schools where Athens and Jerusalem are still taken seriously. And if you can build a vocational record there, then maybe 20, 25 years from now, when the big schools have hopefully begun to recover their sanity, which many of them have lost in recent years, um, you might have a chance at what looks like a successful academic career. But at the moment, the state of Western academic life is pretty sad. This place is accepted, is an exception, obviously. Um, but uh, most of the famous universities in American higher education are in thrall to this new Gnosticism. Either they're teaching it or they're bending over backwards not to insult people who believe in it. And the politicization of intellectual life has become, dare I use the word, pandemic uh, in our time. And that's a real problem for people who think that Athens and Jerusalem really really belong together. So I would, my simple advice would be to uh, furnish your mind and then look for niche places where Athens and Jerusalem uh, are still understood to have important things to say to each other. Okay, uh, sir, if I may uh, follow up the previous question, uh, because uh, Rod Dreher in his book, uh, The Benedict Option, uh, compared the current situation to the situation during Benedict of Norcia, who lived in the 6th century. And first question, do you agree with this, uh, uh, what he said? And second thing, um, is it possible to save uh, the Western civilization uh, in any way? And if not, uh, where lies the future of the Catholic Church? John Eck, you always ask these simple questions in our classroom conversations, and you haven't disappointed here tonight. Um, I think the Benedict option is a clever slogan that doesn't have a whole lot of substance underneath it. Uh, and I also think it's a misreading of, of St. Benedict. I mean, yeah, they were sitting up in Monte Cassino, but they were very much involved in salvaging classical culture. We wouldn't have a lot of the texts we have today had it not been for those monks in Scriptoria working away. Um, and beyond that, I think uh, this notion of a church that self-ghettoizes, this is what I was referring to in discussing the public church, is, is frankly a betrayal of the gospel. Um, you know, I'm sorry if some people are disappointed that their political lives haven't worked out the way they thought they would. Mine certainly hasn't. But I don't think that's any reason for me uh, to stop whatever I can contribute to the evangelization of my country, the Western world, whatever. Uh, we are not called to hide. Uh, after the first Pentecost, First Christians in an infinitely more, well, if not infinitely more, but in a very hostile cultural environment, did not sit down as a little group of the elect and wait for the second coming. They went out and got on with the job they were given in Matthew 28, 19. So I don't see how it's at all responsible 
to say, okay, let's all move to northern Idaho and, and set up intentional Christian communities, and then our grandchildren will sort this out. Um, that's a caricature, obviously, but I get somewhat aggravated with this thing. Um, I have no idea whether Western civilization is going to survive. I mean, I don't have a whole lot of use for um, Joe and Lai, the old foreign minister of what was then North Vietnam, but when, when Joe and Lai was asked in the 1960s, what, have you, what do you think of the French Revolution? And he paused a moment and said, it's too early to tell. Um, that was perhaps the only wise thing he ever said in his life. Um, I, who knows? I mean, who knows? Um, uh, no one in the United States, which were then British colonies in the 1740s, anticipated what we call in the United States the First Great Awakening, which was this huge evangelical conversion of masses of the population that actually had a lot to do with the American Revolution. Nobody expected 100 years later what was called the Second Great Awakening, which had a lot to do with the Civil War. Nobody in 1955 expected 1968. So, I mean, the short answer and the long answer is I don't know. I think I can describe some of the deep problems that have to be addressed in the Western world if if the Western world is going to continue in continuity with this Jerusalem-Athens dialectic as one of its founding cultural realities. And that's what I tried to do uh, a, bit of, uh, a bit of here. Um, but there are no guarantees in, in history. I mean, there just aren't. The one guarantee we know, which is another reason not to go flee to northern Idaho, uh, uh, is that at the end of the story, God is going to win. And, and we know that because of the resurrection. The resurrection tells us how the human story is going to end. And it is not going to end with God losing. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I think there are great renewal. I think there are enormous resources for renewal within the Western world. Your little think tank in Poland is a good example of that, if I if I may say. Uh, I do believe that ideas have consequences, and that ideas winsomely proposed can make a real difference. So, uh, I'm not giving up, and that's not just stubbornness, that's, <laughs> that's a sense of uh, vocational responsibility. But it could be some very rough sledding uh, ahead. Uh, it could be some very rough sledding ahead. And from a public policy point of view, I will simply say that one of the things the church must do, which the church in the United States, I, I think the bishops of the United States, who often get criticized a lot, they deserve a lot of credit for this, keep open enough public space where we can make our arguments. That's what the whole religious freedom debate in the United States has been about for the past 12 years. Keeping open the public space where we can make our proposal, to use the word of Radem Torres Misio. And that should be true in, in all Western societies. Yes. Thank, thank you, Professor. Um, I wonder if you think that the church actually lost the opportunity to evangelize during the pandemic, where the West had their smugness, as you referred to, dented, and you had a lot of suffering and vulnerable people often met by closed churches or being given Holy Communion by tweezers with gloved hands. Um, and it, the, the word fearlessness does not distinguish the church's actions during that time for me personally. And I wonder, does it actually indicate a crisis of faith within the church itself? Thank you. Um, 
when we're talking about the church, we're talking about 1.3 billion people in a infinity of cultural situations, which most of us know 10% about. Uh, I would say in the situation with which I'm familiar um, in the United States, um, it's a, it was a mixed picture. Some church leaders, without a doubt, acquiesced too easily to the closing of, of houses of worship and so forth. Others got very creative in, in using this technology, which is often used in bad ways, to make this a moment of, of recatechesis and re-evangelization. Um, in the United States, the Catholic schools indisputably and magnificently outperformed the state-run schools, most of which, some of which are still closed. We kept our schools open most of the time. We showed, demonstrated in a very concrete way we believe in, in these children, and we're going to be present to them, not just through a screen. So I think that was, you know, that was a good example of that. And of course, our you know, Catholic health care and Catholic social service agencies uh, in the main did, did a wonderful uh, job. Um, uh, nobody knew at the beginning of this what this was really about. It's the nature of this thing, how dangerous is it really, et cetera, et cetera. Six, nine months out, a little less, I think, uh, acquiescence to fear would have been, would have been useful. Um, and, um, you know, on the other hand, uh, when Catholics who spend far too much time online uh, and in social media start believing nonsense uh, because they have lost all confidence in any authority, whether it's scientific authority or ecclesiastical authority, or that is not a good thing either. That's Athens dropping through the floorboards and Jerusalem becoming a kind of idol. So, you know, there's a lot to think about here coming out of this. I, you know, I, uh, whether we're going to know 20 years what the, from now what the you know, full-term, long-term social and cultural effects of this uh, are, I don't know. But I do think it has revealed a, a profound skepticism about all established authority that is very dangerous. Um, because uh, when, when public life becomes what my friend the columnist George Will calls the survival of the shrillest. You, you got a bad, you got a very bad situation on your hands. And that can happen in the church too. You know, that can happen in the church too. And we need to discipline ourselves about that. Thank you again to Theologia Politichna and to the Angelicum for hosting me. It's great to be here. Thank you very much. Weigel, thank you very much that you agreed to be with us today here in Angelicum. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. And thank you very much to you all, uh, just here in, in Aula Minor and before the screens. I would like to inform you that the next lecture from GP2 Lecture Series by Professor Andrea Riccardi will take place on January 21st. Thank you very much.